Welcome back to the Copenhagen Democracy Summit. The grim truth is that everything we have learned over the last year in Hong Kong was predicted by our guests at the 2020 Copenhagen Democracy Summit. The activist I interviewed a year ago, Joshua Wong, is currently in prison. He's a political prisoner. Today, we'll hear from Nathan Law, who is now in exile in London, and he is firmly of the view that rule of law no longer exists in Hong Kong. Nathan spoke with the Alliance of Democracies Executive Director, Johannes, uh, sorry, Jonas Pareo Plesner. Hi, Nathan. Thanks a lot for, for, for doing this interview and for joining us here for the Copenhagen Democracy Summit. My first question would be the, to describe the current situation and the fight for democracy in Hong Kong. Hello, everyone. I'm Nathan. I'm very honored to be here at the um, Copenhagen Democracy Summit. It's an important platform for us to share our pursuit for democracy and to appeal for support for our democratic struggles. I was uh, a protest leader in 2014's Umbrella Movement, and I was an uh, elected uh, parliamentarian in 2016 at the age of 23, becoming the youngest ever elected uh, legislator in Hong Kong. And I was also a political prisoner. For now, I'm in exile in London and under the wanted list of the national security law. So basically, I am unable to go back to Hong Kong anymore, even though I've put, committed myself uh, for the past years for the democratic struggle there. And by um, really looking at my profile, you could really see how deteriorated Hong Kong's political situation is. Um, I was an elected parliamentarian, but for now, I became a fugitive. I am wanted under the national security law, alongside uh, with uh, the election overhaul uh, took place uh, a month ago, that in Hong Kong, we uh, have completely lost our freedom of speech, freedom of uh, political participation, and also every one of us are living in fear of being uh, repressed by the government. Under the national security law, the government um, prosecutes free speech and political participation in the name of national security, but indeed, uh, they are quashing this voice in order to retain political hegemon, in order to retain the Chinese government's uh, complete dominance in Hong Kong's political space. So in before, we thought that Hong Kong was a place uh, that enjoys division of power, that enjoys a vibrant civil society, and people, they could express their opinion freely. But for now, as uh, Xi Jinping has become much more assertive and confident in his authoritarianism, he transplants the idea of a hegemonic government in mainland China into Hong Kong and quashing all our understandings of division of power, of checks and balances, of rule of law. So in Hong Kong, we have seen a complete crackdown on uh, the democratic system and uh, the election overhaul that directly imposed by Beijing makes Hong Kong's uh, 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 legislative council to become another uh, rubber rubber stamp chamber and massively decreasing the seat of direct election and uh, the democratic participation of Hong Kong people. So uh, to conclude, um, uh, for now, we, we've seen the effect of national security law. People dare not to chant the slogan they used to be speaking about. Uh, political campaigners, they are locked in jail or either on trial or in exile. And uh, for us, we have uh, been witnessing Hong Kong turning into just an ordinary Chinese city under the Communist Party's dictatorship. And for now, the protest movement turns to be more subtle and covert. Uh, it is difficult to, for us to march down to the street openly, but we can channel our energy of support to supporting the economic circle that uh, supports the movement, uh, the cultural artists that produce um, artifacts that are supporting the cause of democracy and uh, for those uh, journalists who are defending uh, front lines and reporting at the front lines of conflict, we are still supporting them. There is still room for activism, but it's just turned a, a bit more subtle. But at the end of the day, as long as Hong Kong people do not give up and we will not give up, uh, there will be democratic movement and we will persist. Thank you, Nathan. That was actually going to be my second question is really since we are gathered here at the Copenhagen Democracy uh, Summit to hear you about what can the international community do more? What can people here today in the room 
what can governments that uh, have representatives to participate, what do you want to see happen to, uh, to push change? For the past two decades, the world has stepped into a democratic decline. Uh, according to the VDEM report last year, in uh, 2020, it was the first year uh, the authoritarian institutions outnumber the democratic ones since 2001. And uh, that uh, decline lingers. Uh, we are still uh, seeing much more institutions around the world turning more authoritarian in 2021. And one of the core reasons why we saw that rise of authoritarianism is I believe the democratic community had complacency, especially when they uh, was uh, dealing with China. Uh, there was a classic modernization theory that they thought China would step into uh, with the rise of uh, middle class, rise of uh, economy and the demands for a uh, rule of law system uh, the, the, the West believed that China would step into a modernization path, uh, becoming more democratic and, and free and liberal. But in fact, China has been stepping into the exact opposite way. Under Xi Jinping's leadership, it became much more authoritarian, exporting uh, authoritarianism through uh, its global initiative and uh, committing human rights violation in order to retain a complete dominant position and quash all the dissents, no matter in Xinjiang and in Hong Kong. So we've seen that trend and, uh, and the world has not been acting uh, actively to counter it. So um, by having this opportunity, I would like to appeal to the democratic countries to stop being complacent, to act. And by doing so, we need, we need a change of perception we haven't been really seeing the global democratic decline as a global problem, just like pandemic and um, uh, climate emergency issue. And for now, we have to see it in that angle. We need global agenda, we need global coordination, we need alliance and we need timetable and actions. And so I think an alliance for democratic countries to tackle authoritarian uh, expansion is much needed uh, it entails um, actions, for example, to sanction officials that are responsible for human rights violation, to have a human rights clause when we deal with them, no matter it's on investment or commercial trade, uh, to have a rigorous um, uh, uh, checks on the infiltration and espionage activities of these countries in our democratic com communities in order to avoid being dismantled and discredited from inside out. These are important elements and uh, this is the time for us to act. Otherwise, it will be too late. Uh, the wave of authoritarian rise will eventually come to your doorstep. And uh, by the time we can no longer to re reverse that. So I think this is the time to act. This is the time for us to see it as a genuine global problem to solve it with unity and with coordinated actions. Thank you, uh, Nathan. Um... My, uh, my next question is, is going to be a little bit more about yourself that you touched upon originally, on what prompted you in, in the first place to, um, to work for freedom and, and democracy and, and how personally you also, uh, uh, of course, see yourself continuing uh, that struggle. I believe that democratic system is the best governing system, even though it's not perfect but it's at least the system that could nurture accountable government, rule of law, and respect to human dignity. In Hong Kong, we used to uh, think Hong Kong was a free place without democracy, uh, but we can really learn lessons from it. Our freedom, our dignity, without the protection of democracy are extremely fragile. And uh, if you look at uh, the situation of Hong Kong, which I've been through, uh, since the 2019 protest movement, we've got more than 10,000 people being arrested. A couple of thousand of them are going through court process. A couple hundreds of them are being locked to jail. And my friend Joshua Wong is one of them. Um, I think Joshua was also present uh, in the summer last year. And um, my heart is always with him. It's pity that almost all the political campaigners in Hong Kong are either on trial, in jail or in, in exile. And I believe that uh, fighting for democracy, paving the way for me to back home and appealing for the international community's support indeed help us 
to save them from this political persecution and to urge the government to respect our basic human rights and basic freedom. I think being involved in politics, one of my initial thoughts is how we could decrease the sufferings of people, how we could be in a, in a society that respects each of us and for the demagogues and people who are obsessive with power, we've got tools to hold them accountable. And that's what a democratic community could do. And that's what democracy could serve. So for me, uh, it's personal because I've got a lot of friends in jail. Um, I've been to jail. I understand how terrible it is. And it's about our society, our communities, and about all the well-beings of our Hong Kongers. So it's a commitment, it's a vocation. And for me, even though I I'm forced to leave Hong Kong, a place that I truly love and uh, a place that I will commit myself uh, for a very, very long time to fight for democracy for it. But I'll still continue the fight and be the voice of Hong Kong.